let me welcome you to the last uh, session of short talks for today and for Eurobioc 2020. My name is Federico Marini and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the INBI. But enough of me today, it's time to introduce the speakers. And uh, the first speaker for this session will be Chen Meng, which is the head of the bioinformatics core facility at the Technical University in Munich. Chen, please, page uh, of yours. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here to introduce you the expression set we were uh, two we developed for visualizing the expression set and uh, aiming to facilitate the biological interpretation of, of, of high throughput data. So in high throughput data, most of the time we want to generate hypothesis or want to check if our data confirm the hypothesis we have already. So in this process, it involves analyzing the data from different angles. In every piece of this analysis, we need a piece of R code to do, do it. And it may be time consuming. And I think if we can visualize the data in an interactive way and do some simple analysis on the fly, when we select a subset of features or a subset of samples, that would be very helpful. That's the original idea why we developed it. So we, we are not aiming to generate like a GUI for R and do different type of analysis because I think that's not possible. We have a really back end relying on R. Back end relying on R means you need to do the data analysis or for example, data normalization, the QC and the statistical analysis and wrap all the data, all the analysis result and together with the phenotype data and feature data into one expression set object. So what you really need to consider is it, it would be good if you can visualize your statistical results in a two-dimensional space. For example, in the t-test or lima, you can visualize a volcano plot. In PCA, you can visualize PC, PC1 and PC2, yeah, something like this. So that's because in the front end, which is implemented by Shiny, you can visualize a scatter plot. And another visualization we have in the shiny front end is the bee swarm. This is similar to the box plot. You can visualize a quantitative variable against a categorical variable. But we prefer bee swarms because every single point can be seen in, in the plot and selected. So the third one is a very widely used heat map. And you can zoom in, zoom out, and select an area in that heat map. And if I have time later in this talk, I will have a sh I will show you an example how to work with it. So when a, when a feature is selected here, we may do, for example, enrichment analysis. When the samples are selected, we can do, for example, a couple of Maya curves stratifying by selected or unselected, or independent, some independent test using of contingency table using the Fisher's exact test or chi-square test. So uh, we, I work with in a core facility. It's very often I need to deliver the results to our collaborators. So I also try to make it make this delivery as, as easy as possible. You can ask your collaborator to install the R package or deploy it through a Shiny server or using Docker. So whatever way you like. So in order to let the data to be visualized in the expression set viewer, there is only one extra requirement imposed to this expression set. So, then, so that is the header of the phenotype data or feature data has to be in this format. You see it has three components and every component separated by a pipe. The first is analysis. And for example, which analysis is doing? The second is the subset. So which subset of features or samples are used in the analysis? And the third one is the variable. Uh, as an example here, you see the t-test. So the t-test means the analysis is t-test. And REVS melanoma it means that we're comparing the renal with melanoma. And the last variable is the fold change or p-value here. Those are the two, val two variables returned by the t-test and can be visualized using for uh, visualized at a volcano plot. Uh, so you have this uh, this kind of uh, header for both phenotype and the feature data. So that's because we may have uh, like thousands of uh, columns in this data. So we need to be able to quickly find these different columns we want to visualize. 
So I think I still have a few minutes. I want to have a live demonstration. Uh, so this is the link. So uh, for example, here, what you see is a heat map. And this is experiment, exper uh, a proteomic experiment measured around 7,000 proteins and 60, 60 cell lines. Um, so uh, we can select one uh, one feature by clicking on the on the on the on the heat map, and then you see the dynamic range and the expression level of the of this protein. You can also brush an area, and so the the intensity the protein intensity is is shown as the box plot. You can also overlay, uh, for example, some quantitative variable or categorical variable. For example, now the doubling time. You can see the doubling time of the of, of the cell lines, and you compare doubling time with a single, for example, a single protein here, and try to look at a regression line. And here, ORA is the overrepresentation analysis. On gene set, you can select an area, then you select maybe 300 proteins, and you can see which gene set is enriched. So this, for example, this mitochondrial membrane protein here, you can see what is the protein name present in this gene set here, those red, those red bars. And you can also search in the string database and then it return you, it links to the string database and return you the network. Um, another function, for example, the FGSEA, you can, you don't need to select, for example, a set, subset of features to do this. Instead, you need to give a variable. For example, we want to give the t-test Sorry, yeah, renal and melanoma, and give the. Sorry, I'm working on a remote server here. It's a bit slow. Um, the main difference, then the FGS EA algorithm will be run and return you the table. Directly, you can check the leading edge proteins on every gene set by clicking on the rows, and you can see. Zoom in to the to check the check the proteins. So when you select a uh, brush and area in the heat map, you also have selected some features. Then you can, for example, compare the features you selected with uh, to select a variable. One so minute. my internet. Okay, so my internet here is a bit slow. Yeah, so you can see the video tutorial. We have we have applications of all these examples. I think here, for example, the, ori the origin we have. This, this is contingency table and return the, the significant test result is here, and we can also select the samples using the sample space. Here is an example of PCA results, and different color means different origin of of cell lines. And here is the feature space. We're visualizing the, the volcano plot. Uh, yeah, I hope this is, uh, is useful for your research. And thanks for watching. Perfect timing and perfect, very nice talk. Uh, I'll see whether there are some questions. I see some raised hands, but please, so we don't, for the interest of time, we'd like to you to post the, the questions in the in the chat, so in the in the Q and A tab, where I can pick them from there. In the meanwhile, while that person might be typing that, uh, I am in a perfectly biased position as a co-developer of the IT software. So yeah, yeah. I'm super interested in see what expression set viewer can do. And I'm happy to see that there is a lot of, say, non-overlapping features. So it's actually quite useful. For example, can you can you think of switching from uh, summarize experiment objects to uh, E set, even if it's a, say, earlier set? to use additional functionality or the other way around. So so what set do you mean? Uh, from E set, from expression set, you would mm -hmm. you can change, you can uh, actually update that object to a summarized experiment object. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of uh, have both of both worlds. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think I just uh, saw I see in this conference actually, <laughs> but I didn't attend that session, unfortunately. But I think okay. it's better. I want to make this uh, also compatible with summarize experiment because I think this the annotation data frame is the 
as four vector annotation. I think that is a u- very useful feature because we have a lot of gene set information which are banner re- very sparse. I think we can use the sparse vector in this case. So I would like to make it compatible with summarized experiment. <laughs> okay, there might be already some kind of the answer to that from Laurent because so that there are methods that can actually con- uh, handle that conversion for you. So. Uh, if you want, so you can get in touch. Okay, I see the message has been removed by the chat. In MSN base, for example, there is a functionality to do so. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, Chen, I guess you will be also at the tables uh, afterwards in the lounge. Mm-hmm. I will move on to the next speaker so that we try to keep the schedule as tight as possible. Our next, and thank you, of course. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is Alan, o- Alan O'Callaghan. And Alan will be delivering recorded talk, which I'm going to start now. Alan, if you want, you can come on screen so that people can see you. Perfect. OK. Enjoy the video. Hi, I'm Alan, and I'm here to talk a little bit about two R packages that I submitted in Bioconductor 3.12. These are Snefter and DenseFizz. And these provide scalable or density preserving, nonlinear dimensionality reduction. But as with most things in life, you can only have one and not both. So to very briefly describe what I mean by non-linear dimensionality reduction, in this case, I'll focus on TSNE. And what TSNE does is it creates a low-dimensional representation of the neighborhood structure of the data. I'll describe what that means in more detail quite shortly. But uh, I thought a picture tells a thousand words. And so here I've shown a TSNE embedding of data from Zysel et al., which is from the SC RNA seq package, single cell RNA sequencing data. And the x and the y axis are TSNE coordinates. And the color here represents the cell type. And so, what a TSNE embedding is, is it is a low dimensional embedding where cells that are neighbors in the high dimensional space are also neighbors in the low dimensional space. And so, this can be really useful to provide some intuition about groupings and trajectories within the data can also be useful to make qualitative judgments about data quality and how effective different clustering algorithms have been. And so one example of a way that you might make qualitative judgments about data quality or how effective your clustering algorithms have been is to look at gene expression values overlaid on one of the dimensionality reduction figures. In this case, Chen1, which is then identified as the Merck gene, and this type of plot can be really useful in identifying how specific these marker genes are to different clusters within the data. But TSNE actually has a number of drawbacks that I would like to discuss here. The first is that it's not very scalable to large numbers of cells due to the way the algorithm is implemented. And the second is that because it's concerned mainly with preserving the neighborhood structure of the data, tends to discard information about the heterogeneity or homogeneity of different groups or trajectories within the data. So to address this first criticism of TSNE, uh, Linderman et al. in 2019 published this fast interpolation-based TSNE algorithm, which is implemented in the OpenTSNE Python library. And you might ask, uh, given that we're at a bioconductor conference, why am I talking about Python? Well, the Snifter library actually wraps this OpenTSNE library and uh, hopefully abstracts away some of the pain of calling Python with an R. And so to call this FITSNE algorithm, you simply need to apply an S a matrix. And then in this case, I'm also supplying uh, the number of cores and the number of jobs that I would like the algorithm to use. And the embeddings created using this fast interpolation based algorithm have a low embedded error, which is to say that they're very similar to the embeddings created using Barnes Hut or other implementations of TSNE, which you can see here, this embedding is very similar to the one that we looked at earlier. And the efficiency of these algorithms allow us to scale TSNE to a very large number of points, or a large number of cells. In this case, I'm showing the time taken to complete plotted against the number of cells on the x-axis. And you can see that our TSNE takes around 10 hours to complete for a half a million cells, while Snifter takes just about an hour. And the Snifter library has one more trick up its sleeve, and that is that in addition to being able to um, create an embedding, we can also, after creating an embedding, project new points into that embedding. 
which is what this code here is doing. The first argument is the existing embedding that we created earlier. The second argument is the new expression values that we want to project into this existing embedding. And the third argument is the expression values that we used to create the original embedding. So if we look at the original embedding that we created using the Zeisel et al. data, which is shown on the left, we can then take some independently produced data, uh, in this case, single nuclear RNA-seq data produced by Yakel et al. We can project these new data into that existing embedding. We can see that uh, cells tend to be projected next to similar cells. And this can be really useful for assessing the quality of data integration algorithms. So wrapping around to the second criticism of TSNE that I outlined earlier, which is that it considers only neighborhood structure and not actual density points in the high dimensional space. Ashwin Narayan et al, who has an aside, has the coolest dream job that I've ever heard of, published this preprint, which includes a density preserving modification to the TSNE objective function, which actually helps to consider the local density of points in the high dimensional space. Why might we care about the local density of points in a high dimensional space? Well, in my opinion, heterogeneity actually matters when we're talking about uh, clusters or groups of cells. Uh, and so I've produced this very uh, simple toy example where we have a two dimensional data set, um, which has two very easily separable clusters. Um, the blue cluster in the bottom left is very homogeneous, which is to say that all cells within this cluster are very, very similar to each other. And the top right cluster, the red cluster, are very heterogeneous, which is to say that cells in this cluster are actually very dissimilar to each other. If we apply standard TSNE to this data, we can see that because it's only concerned with the neighborhood structure of the data, it actually treats these two clusters as being basically equivalent, and it completely discards the information about homogeneity or heterogeneity. And so, Using DenseVis, we can actually apply this density preserving TSNE algorithm to the same data. We can see that this better preserves both the neighborhood structure of the data and also the local density of the data, as it shows that the red cluster is more dispersed. And accurately considering heterogeneity and homogeneity in single cell data is increasingly important as we begin to apply algorithms that directly consider heterogeneity such as those that consider differences in cell type composition. Uh, just to make a brief aside about the implementation details of the package, in addition to abstracting away some of the pain of interacting with, with Python within R, um, because of Basilisk, both DenseVis and Snifter also include Conda environments that ensure that the um, computing environment that's used to call Python from within R is both controlled and reproducible across different versions and different uh, computing environments. Uh, so to summarize, Snifter and DenseVis provide scalable and density-preserving dimensionality production algorithms. These algorithms, in my opinion, greatly enhance TSNE for model sing modern single-cell applications and the modern building blocks in the bioconductor ecosystem, such as Basilisk, uh, make complex development tasks remarkably easy. And to finish up, I'd just like to thank some people, in particular my boss, Catalina Vallejos, Aaron Lund, for both developing the Basilisk package and also for providing the inspiration for the Snifter library. Also, I'd like to thank the MRC Human Genetics Unit in the University of Edinburgh for providing my stipend and also, at least conceptually, providing me with a place to work. Also, I would like to thank the developers of uh, Articulate Library and, of course, everyone in the Bioconductor core team and uh, Bioconductor developers, and, of course, you for listening. So thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Alan, for the nice talk and for the content of it. It was pretty dense, pun intended. Let me see if we have already questions from the audience. I'm, in the meanwhile, you're muted, but uh, so you can unmute yourself. What you could, what otherwise I would be asking, right? Because we didn't see that in the comparison that you showed. How does UMAP actually uh, perform with respect to the perform to, to to the scalability, so the performance-wise, and also with the density parameter? Can that be also somehow incorporated into that? Um, 
So uh, there's a there's a density preserving um, version of UMAP in um, the densest package as well. Um, like normal UMAP has fundamentally the same types of problems as um, TSNE does in terms of like just preserve just considering the neighborhood structure of the data. Uh, and in terms of scalability, I think that like FITSNE is fairly close to UMAP originally. Okay. So like uh, it's like uh, normal UMAP is much faster than standard or Barnes or TSNE. Okay, perfect. Uh, then just a quick one on top, because there is a very interesting question from Vince Carey. Any comments on tuning parameter settings? Yes, yeah, so actually the OpenTSNE library also um, adapts some ideas from, I think it's another paper by uh, Linderman, or, or maybe it's someone else, um, but on like choosing optimal parameter settings for TSNE. Um, I don't know that I've adopted all of those clever ideas in DenseViz. Unfortunately, um, but I can certainly look at doing that. There might be the, the group, or the, the other group could be the one from Dimitri Kobak. And uh, but anyway, so let's move on to the next talk. And thanks again, Alan, for the for interacting with us after the talk. Uh, the next speaker is going to be Maria Dermit, and uh, she is from the Queen Mary, Queen Mary University in London, and she will be giving a live talk. And given the question that come from Alan, I think Alan, it's probably best if you find let yourself find each other uh, at a table in the lounge area afterwards. Okay, Maria, please take the screen. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to um, this uh, packet that we developed uh, called PECORA, that stands for Peptide Correlation uh, Analysis. And so PECORA is a SIP in Italian, so that's why we put uh, a SIP in the logo. So I have to say that the packet is not yet in Bioconductor, but we are very close uh, to, um, to submit it. Uh, so. Um, Basically, um, as, uh, as you may know, uh, in shotgun proteomics, um, peptides, are, um, peptides are produced uh, from proteases like uh, trypsin, and then the protein quantities are inferred from the group peptide quantities. So uh, in this example here, uh, you can see how the level of, a, of this given protein increase uh, in, in this biological treatment. Uh, so the quantity, the quantitative values of all the peptides for these proteins change in the same direction. But you can also imagine another scenario where uh, the quantitative levels of a protein doesn't change, as you can see here, but the quantitative values for the individual peptides uh, disagree. So for example, this can be when a peptide gets phosphorylated as uh, shown here in the example. And so what happens is that the value for the total uh, level uh, for the green peptide uh, is downregulated uh, upon treatment. Uh, so multiple strategies have focused on the detection and removal of these discordant peptides, like uh, for example, the MS stats uh, packet. But what we aim to do in the PECORA packet is to actually gain uh, protein isoforms, gain information about uh, different protein isoforms. Uh, so actually, uh, as it was uh, shown yesterday, uh, I pretty much, I, I quite like uh, the functionality offer in Q features where you can see the, the aggregated protein levels, uh, uh, as you can see here on the right hand side, but also next to the uh, protein levels, you can see how uh, the peptide values changes across uh, different conditions. So you can appreciate very clearly the variability uh, across different uh, peptides for a given protein. So what we uh, aim to do in the PECORA uh, package is to yeah, gain a uh, protoform uh, information. So uh, to do that, uh, these are the steps that we follow uh, in the in the PECORA method. So first, there is a global scaling and centering of peptides uh, per replicate, and this is something that uh, you know is pretty common uh, in any proteomics uh, pipeline. Uh, then each peptide uh, is a scale to the center of the control condition, as you can see here. And then uh, the PECORA algorithm fits a linear model for its unique peptide uh, in the protein that includes an interaction between treatments and peptide groups. And then uh, we perform an ANOVA test. Uh, 
So this calculates a p-value uh, for testing whether each peptide agrees with the group of all of the of all other peptides in that protein. And then uh, p-values for the peptides are recorded, and then we perform a multiple uh, multiple uh, hypothesis testing uh, on a per protein basis. Uh, so there is a there is an additional uh, peptide scaling step that improves the statistical power of the p-value for it for uh, interaction. Uh, so. Uh, we actually did some uh, filtering uh, as well. So we didn't consider all the peptides. So for example, uh, we exclude peptides that map to uh, multiple proteins. Uh, we only consider those proteins that contain at least two peptides. And then uh, peptides that had big areas less than 100 were discar discarded and um, peptides that didn't have quant uh, quantitative values in all replicates were discarded. So this could be potentially um, uh, improved in the future by uh, doing some sort of imputation, but this is how the method is uh, currently. So um, we initially use as benchmark a, a mouse microglia data set where, um, where uh, there were three conditions. So there was the control, um, 50 millimolar alcohol treatment and a LPS stimulation. And so uh, that data um, came from the Gerges et al. Uh, paper. And so uh, we uh, were working with 26,000, over 26,000 peptides that belong to uh, almost 3,000 proteins. Um, one thing that, that we observe as, after applying the PECORA method is that there were quite a lot of protein with proteins with at least one discordant peptide but most of the peptide uh, of a given protein behave similarly so this is great news uh, for like you know the um, standard way of quantifying proteins by aggregating a peptide but also mean that we can uh, you know gain some uh, protoform information so in the next slide, uh, I'm going to show you uh, an example uh, of how PECORA can detect uh, uh, PTM changes. So uh, here you can see a, a peptide uh, that um, a peptide that belonged to PKA protein. And was, uh, what we um, uh, what we got from the PECORA analysis is that a peptide that has an oxidation on methionine 331, uh, as you can see here uh, in green, uh, was detected as a significant increasing of, uh, upon LPS stimulation. So uh, this peptide was detected with and without the oxidation, the oxidative form, but only the oxidized peptide was significantly increased due to LPS stimulation. So this is just an example of a, a direct observation um, uh, of this potentially regulated PTM site that was uncovered by PECORA. And it will have other white smiths uh, when using the standard protein uh, quantity summaries. So uh, in, uh, in summary, uh, I saw you... Oops. In summary, uh, I saw you uh, that the, the PECORA uh, workflow uh, helps to uh, helps gain in quantitative protein information from bottom-up proteomics experiment. Um, I didn't uh, show you uh, the results here, but we also the, uh, we also found that actually the PECORA approach can be used as a quantitative, um, uh, as a quality control for incorrect pe uh, pick picking. So actually, if you go into the paper, you can see some examples where we uh, where we uh, saw that. Uh, also, uh, the PECORA packets can take uh, uh, data sets processed with different tools, such as uh, Skyline or Progenesis or uh, MaxQuan. So for now, uh, the packets only takes a label-free uh, protein, but uh, you know we are hoping to um, uh, extend this, for example, uh, to a SILAC uh, data set. And also, uh, I didn't show it to you uh, today, but again, you can go into the paper and you can um, and you can read there how we uh, also found that actually uh, using PECORA as a pre-filtering step uh, to remove um, uh, to remove discordant peptides helps reducing the number of false positive uh, in a similar way uh, to um, the, the in a similar way to um, the the quality. Uh, obtained by uh, the MSTATS uh, approach. Um, and so with that, I would like to thank um, 
thank um, Jesse Mayer from the Mayer Lab for um, his conceptualization of this uh, project. Uh, also, uh, my, lab, uh, my uh, lab members and my boss, uh, Faras Mardake, for his uh, guidance and um, an input, uh, the founding bodies, uh, MRC, and of course everyone uh, in the Bioconductor project, and uh, you for your attention, and I'm very happy to take uh, questions and uh, feedback as well. So thank you very much. Perfect. Great talk, Maria. Uh, thanks a lot. It's well, It was very informative for me as a non-proteomics person, but uh, let's see if there are already, there are some raised hands again, so put questions in the in the in the chat please so that it's easiest and there's a question from nils kurzava that says great talk do you think you could gain confidence in your eyes in your isoforms by grouping peptides based on similarity before testing that's a yeah that's a very good suggestion i haven't explored that and um, maybe that's something yeah i think there are several things that uh, you know we could improve um in in the packet so that's the reason that you know we haven't submitted yet to bioconductor but that's actually a, a very a uh, good question that we haven't looked into, but uh, it will be useful to, yeah, it will be something really interesting to look into. Okay, just a quick one then on top of it from your fellow uh, sessionist, Chen Meng. In the data you work with, how many proteins you can see a different abundance in their eyes of forms? Uh, so about 15%, um, if that's what he okay. meant. Okay, that's mm -hmm. quite something. Okay, uh, Maria, you are also invited to join the tables in the lounge area afterwards. So, in case a few questions would come too late uh, re with respect to the to the time that we have, uh, thank you again. I'll mm -hmm. stop your screen sharing for you, and I would invite our next speaker to come on screen. Our next speaker is Vito, and I'm just going to start the recorded talk that he has. So please enjoy the viewing. Hi, Vitold. Hello, I am Vitold. I work at the Functional Genomics Center in Zurich, and I will be presenting the package for proteomics label free quantification uh, developed here. I have to assume that you know what label free quantification and mass spectrometry is. Here is a brief slide as a reminder. Just I mentioned we run LFQ experiments at the Functional Genomics Center since 2007. And since 2016, we have a fully automated reproducible workflow, which also has some R components, a shiny app, and uses some bioconductor packages. And it is available on GitHub. In 2017, we set out to improve the LFQ analysis at FGZ. The motivation for it was uh, that um, there are several MS methods, data abandoned acquisition, DDA, DIA. There is um, a plethora of software to pre-process MS data, progenesis, MS Fragger. There are R packages to analyze LFQ data, MS stats, MS QROP, ROPECA. And also the experimental design sometimes is factorial and people want to test interactions. And there are more samples and conditions. Somehow we wanted to accommodate um, these facts by preserving MS methods and experimental design specific names and figures and tables of our reports. We also wanted to make it easy to integrate new formats because we had the feeling like every month there is a new format. We wanted also to run different methods using a similar interface like the carrot package for the machine learning methods, STAS and R. And we want to test uh, for interactions and when we have multiple hypothesis tests, some will provide the integrated visualization of these results. What we did also want is uh, to have a simple representation of the data within our package uh, so that you don't have to learn a complex API to somehow visualize the data or implement some filtering method. And therefore we base the whole package on a data frame and internally the data is also represented a single daily frame. The data 
in order to achieve it, we had to provide a configuration object, which is an R6, which somehow describes what columns contain what, so the functions we implemented can work with this data frame. Although the names of the data frame are arbitrary, you can define them yourself. So we have, for instance, a hierarchy field which points to the columns contained, containing, for instance, the protein, peptide, and precursor IDs for proteomics, or the metabolite IDs for metabolomics data. We point to the columns containing the factors of your experimental design. We point to the column with the intensity and the raw file name. So having this, every function internally operates on a data frame, a tidy data frame, on, the, on this config object. We have predefined configuration. On the right side, you see how you could set up um, the analysis from, for instance, MaxQuant data. So here we read MaxQuant data, which is not in a tidy format, converted to a data frame in tidy format. Then we are adding here the annotation to, to this table and specify in which column the factors of this design are specified. The package contains dozens of functions and somehow to structure these functions, some are for plotting, some are for aggregating peptides to proteins, others are for some statistics like computing CV standard deviations of the measurement or computing the required sample size. We came up with uh, LFQ data class, which implements base functionality and decorator classes, which group together similar function. For instance, the plotter class has a heat map function. You can use it to plot PCAs. And using this um, API, you can easily pre-process your data, transform it, aggregate peptides to proteins, but you also can create plots for your reports or store your data, write your data, you transform data to disk. For modeling, we have implemented the same approach. All the results are stored in a tidy data frame. We support linear models, we support mixed effect models, we support generalized models. Once the models are fitted, given a model formula, you can compute ANOVA for every protein. You can store the ANOVA results, which are again a tidy table. You can visualize them. Given the models and a contrast specification, you can compute the contrast, test the hypothesis. Using the wall test, you can moderate the obtained p-values Using the LIMA approach, you can compute beta distribution-based significances to summarize peptide models on protein level, like suggested by the Ropeka package. So given this API, it's relatively easy and straightforward to, co uh, to generate reports. Here you see an example of a LFQ report we ship to our customers. You have one section where we link to QC-related visualization and exploratory analysis-related visualization. And to the right, you see visualizations of the modeling, like p-value distribution, estimate distributions, p-value distributions of the ANOVA analysis, volcano plots. Next, you see also that we have some benchmarking facilities. So if you have a benchmarking data set where the ground truths are known, um, you can benchmark the functions like the normalization, protein aggregation, or the modeling functions. In conclusion, our package allows to combine normalization methods, aggregation methods with modeling and testing. Data is represented using a tidy data frame. So you can at any point manipulate, uh, implement functions, link up, you can make visualizations using ggplot2. The subsystem code is relatively mature, but we work on the API. 
you want to use clear package uh, patterns to make the use of the package more intuitive. The name of the package is also not fixed. You can install it using GitHub and feedback is welcome. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues from the Proteome Informatics Group of the FGZ, Paolo from the Proteome Service Group, and uh, mention that this project was partially funded by the Technology Platform Fund of the University of Zurich. And I would like to thank you for your attention and welcome your questions. Okay, perfect. Uh, Vitor, are you back with us? Yes, I guess. So there, first of all, thank you for the nice presentation and quite a massive package you've got there with a nice collaboration, collaborative effort. There is a question for you from Johannes Reiner. Uh, how and with what package and software are you quantifying the LCMS level one data? <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, it's not a R package. It's um, for instance, you can, um, there is plenty of software out. Uh, so we use uh, LF, uh, MaxQuant for sure. We use um, Spectronaut um, for um, DIA data. Um, yeah, uh, I think they are on the slides. Uh, Pro, uh, Proteome Discoverer, whatever. MOF, we looked into, yeah. Okay, thank you. There is no further question. So in the interest of time, I just move on to our next speaker. Thank you again, Bittel. Again, for you as well, the offer to join in the lounge room is on. Our next speaker is Anmod Ferreira. And she's from the Department of Statistics in Stanford. And for her, it's quite early. So <laughs> some hearts to, <laughs> to her to encourage in the talk. And nice with me. <laughs> yes, yes, we do hear you, we see you, and you're totally fit for us. Okay, uh, you can start sharing your screen. Thanks uh, for the introduction. So today I will describe you the workflow we use to analyze a site of uh, data using packages that are available on Bioconductor. And so site of stands for cytometry by time of flight. And this technology allows us to measure protein expression at a single cell resolution. And to do so, we use antibodies that target these proteins. And these antibodies are labeled with a heavy metal isotope. And this specificity gives a very distinct peak that represents the atomic masses that we can see here. And this allows us to measure up to 50 proteins at a single cell uh, level. So uh, this protein can be a marker of cell types or uh, cell uh, phenotype. And we use this technology to study cell population variation between different experimental conditions. Uh, so we use this technology in the context of dengue virus, and I will use this study as an example throughout the description of our workflow. And so dengue virus is a significant cause of morbidity in many regions of the world. And what uh, was interested for, interesting for us is that children have a greater risk of developing severe dengue than adults. And this increased risk in children may be due to differences in the immune response. Usually, this immune response is driven by B cell and T cell, but there is evidence uh, that natural killer cell might have a role in dengue infection. So, a natural killer cell or NK cell are actually a subset of immune cells, and uh, they are the first ones that respond to viral, uh, viral infection. So, our goal here uh, was to determine whether NK cell in children and adults respond differently to acute dengue infection and if this could explain the greater risk of developing severe dengue in children. So our uh, cohort consisted in uh, two groups, so adults and uh, pediatrics uh, patients. And in each uh, group, we had dengue-infected patients that were enrolled in uh, Panama, as well as an LC control sample to compare to. So to analyze this data and try to answer this uh, question, we use the following workflow and I will uh, describe it step by step. So the first step is to uh, actually import the data, the raw data in R. And so we use the Flowcore package and uh, we import to import basically this FCS file. So the FCS file are the raw data coming out of the site of machine to a flow set object. And then we uh, converted this object into a single set experiment object because this class is pretty nice. It provides a good core data structure and a framework for the downstream analysis. 
So I want to show you uh, how this object looks like in the context of site of uh, data. So in the middle, we have the uh, assay, uh, which actually contains the proteins expression. And the columns are the cells, and the rows are uh, correspond to the proteins. So if we look in the call uh, data information, we'll find information, obviously, about the cell. And we know which cell belongs to which uh, samples. And if we look in the raw data, we will have information about the protein, and we can know which protein in the uh, cell type marker or phenotypic marker. And we can also uh, find have additional uh, metadata, like uh, the demonstrative reduction, for instance. Uh, the next step is to identify a subset of cells which are similar to each other within uh, this NK cell population. And we use a catalyst package which propose a clustering method adapted uh, to site of data. And this method uh, combines two algorithms that are also available on a bioconductor. And so the first step is to cluster the data into a high resolution clusters with FlowSum and then regroup uh, this uh, cluster into meta clusters with a consensus cluster plus algorithm. So we use a uh, 35 uh, protein uh, markers that we can see here uh, that are present in our NK cell population. And we obtain these seven uh, meta clusters. And so Catalyst provide us with this uh, very uh, informative protein markers in, uh, protein marker expression heat map. And uh, this allows us to annotate manually the marker, uh, the clusters, as we can see here. And it helps us to uh, identify them and uh, their function, actually, for the downstream analysis. Um, Catalyst was also interesting in, for us because it works uh, nicely with DiffSight, which is a package we used uh, into uh, for our next step. And uh, here the goal is to uh, identify differences in the frequencies of the clusters between uh, dengue infected patient and LC control uh, sample. So we use a diff side DA WOOM uh, function. DA stands for differential abundance. And it has integrated the WOOM method uh, to stabilize the mean variance relationships and then fits a linear model for each cluster. So if you look at the result, on top we have the uh, adults uh, patients, and on the bottom we have the pediatric uh, patients. And we compare dengue-infected patients that are here in purple to the uh, LC control sample that are here in, in blue. And so if I look first, at, if we look first at the adult patient, we see that there were like no significant changes that were identified for any of the clusters. However, in the case of the pediatric uh, patient, I would like to highlight these uh, two clusters, so cluster 5 and cluster uh, 2, which are significantly different uh, in terms of frequencies. So for cl cluster 5, uh, we had an increase, uh, a decrease, sorry, of the frequency in the dengue-infected uh, patient, which indicates a decrease of the activation signature of the NK cell. And for cluster two, we had uh, actually an increase in the frequency in the dengue uh, infected patient, and this is an increase in the killing response. Uh, this killing response is possibly not specific enough also to contribute to to contribute to the viral clearance. And the last step is to identify marker which are uh, predictive of a dengue infection uh, condition. And we use a custom-made uh, package uh, that is called uh, CytoGLMM, which is not on Bioconductor yet, but we hope it will be in the future. And as its names indicate, this package is based on generalized linear mix model, which uh, incorporates subject-subject variability, which add uh, power to our analysis. And so the model uh, we use here is a generalized linear model with a bootstrap. And we get the log odds that a given marker is predictive of a specific condition with a 95% uh, confidence interval. So if you look at the result, on the left, we have the adult. And on the right, we have the pediatric uh, patients. And basically, protein on the left of the red line are predictive of the dengue uh, condition. And in adult, uh, we identify a some markers of activation that we can see here in red that indicate that the NK cells are likely capable of responding to the dengue infection. And in pediatric, however, we had a limited of these activation markers. And so to conclude, I would like to say that I presented you a workflow to uh, which, which use mainly bioconductor packages to analyze in a non-biased way the high demonstrated site of data. 
And the goal of this workflow is to detect potential difference between experimental condition. And the result of the analysis I presented to you here uh, suggests that dengue infected, uh, dengue disease severity in pediatric patients might be partially explained by diminution in the NK cell activation. And I would like to thank my mentor, Professor Holm and Professor Blish, as well as my collaborator on this project, uh, Roya McKenney, Davis Beltran, and Professor Lopez. And I thank you for your attention and the Bioconductor Conference Committee that gave me the opportunity to present my work today. And I'm happy to answer any question. Okay, perfect. And I thank you, Anmod, for the perfect delivery and excellently on time. I see already questions in the chat, in the Q&A. So is, there is one from David Risso, Anmod, can you comment on the computational efficiency of your GLMM approach? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, actually, for so we have like two different um, models in, in the package. So one is a general linear mixed model and the other one is a general linear uh, model. So with bootstrap, so the bootstrap obviously take a bit more time because we need to bootstrap uh, the, the, the donors to compute the donor effect. But else it's, it's pretty similar to what exists out there, for example, in deep site. I think it's, uh, it's as efficient. Okay. There is also another question from Vince Carey. Any thoughts on the power to detect differences between the subgroups in adults? This relates to the first comparison of clusters. Uh, differences between the subgroup in adults. I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. Uh, Maybe then in the interest of time, I would say yeah. you can regroup Sorry. later at the tables. Yeah, but, okay, I'll be happy uh, to discuss. Yeah, later perfect. Later. So, I mean, we're running a little late than, uh, later than expected, but say, I hate to kill conversation just like that, but since we have this opportunity, then before you go back to your uh, deserved nap. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you Anmol again, and thank you, Vince, for asking. And let's move on to the next speaker, also the last speaker of this short session, which is Paul Castellano Escuder from the University of Barcelona. Paul, how? Uh, how are you doing? Hi. Perfect, we do not hear you yet. You're Hi. still muted. How are you? Okay, perfect. Paul already also sent a recording for his talk and I'm just gonna start playing it. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Castellano and I am a PhD student at the University of Barcelona. Now I'm going to present the POMA Bioconductor Package that is focused on the statistical analysis of mass spectrometry data. This is the outline of the, of the presentation. It starts with the scope of POMA, followed by the POMA workflow, uh, which is divided in four sequential blocks, and finally the conclusion and the, and the future work. The POMA package is focused on the statistical analysis of mass spectrometry data, for example, metabolomics and proteomics, and there are different ways to proceed with the, the statistical analysis of this, this kind of data. The first one is work directly from, from SHIP, an Excel file, for example. This is a widely used option, but is the least reproducible way. Another option can be to use the final bioconductor structures like MSN set objects from MSN based packets. Uh, however, to perform different statistical analysis, uh, all the quantitative uh, data have to be extracted from this object and adapted to be used by all different packages that we want to use to perform the statistical analysis. This option is better than the first one and more, uh, more reproducible, but it's not very interoperable. So we have to adapt the, the data for each statistical analysis package we want to use. And the last one is to use directly the, the MSN set objects skipping all the intermediate steps. And this could be a very good option to keep all data structure performing all different statistical approaches on the, on the same object class. The first step of the POMA workflow is the data formatting. The input required in POMA is an MSN set object. Uh, in our input, we need basically two, two things, the metadata with sample IDs, sample groups, and optional covariates, and the features file with all quantitative features in the, in the study. If we don't have an MSN set object, then our data is stored in different data frames or metrics. This POMA function allo uh, allows to create users, uh, mm, to, to create the, the, the needed input, for POMA in, a, in an easy way. The second step of the workflow is the preprocessing block, which is composed of three functions. The first one is for missing value imputation and treatment of zeros. 
Here, users can remove those features with too many missing value and include uh, those remaining missing values with seven different algorithms provided. Then, the Poma norm is, uh, function is used to, to normalize the data metrics and understanding for normalization uh, both transformation and scaling processes. Here again, six different algorithms are provided for, for this purpose. The last uh, step of preprocessing is the layer detection and, and data cleaning. With the same function, uh, users can, uh, only changing two parameters, users can explore the sample outliers in the data with different plots and tables, as well as draw the detected outliers from the data, returning a preprocessed and clean MSN set object prepared for the statistical analysis. This is an example of, of preprocessing output, uh, output um, provided by, by POMA, where all different algorithms used to, to preprocess the data are, are recorded into the into the object. The third block is the exploratory data, data analysis focused on data visualization before and after the processing process. All functions here are designed to be very flexible and easy to use. In this example, we, we can see the Poma boxplot function that allows to display the boxplot of, sam uh, of samples or boxplot of features, depending on the, on the group parameter. Here, if feature box are displayed, users can explore only those features of interest instead of all features uh, at the same time by indicating those features as a vector in the feature name parameter. And finally, the last uh, part of, of workflow is the statistical analysis part. And all methods provided in POMA are listed here. Uh, the first one is the univariate analysis test, uh, providing both parametric and non-parametric tests like t-test, ANOVA, and COVA, is if covariates are provided, Wilcoxon test, and Gerstle wallis Multivariate analysis, like PCA, PLSDA, and SPLSDA. Cluster analysis conducted by k-means algorithm, and these, these computed uh, clusters by k-means algorithm are projected in a multidimensional scaling plot for visualization. Lima, the known Lima package. This is a wrapper of uh, Lima bioconductor package to, to calculate uh, Lima models, both with, uh, designed with and without covariates in a very easy way. Correlation analysis, both for calculation and visualization, parallel correlations, correlogram visualization, network correlations, and Gaussian graphical models. Different regularization methods, such as lasso, bridge regression, and lasting net, allowing train and test split. I will explain this in the next slides. Random forest, this is a classical random forest algorithm for classifications and also allowing train and test split that I will explain. Rank plot calculation, this is a wrapper of rank plot, uh, rank plot bioconductor package that allows to, calcul, uh, to calculate rank products in a various way. And finally, the odds ratio calculation based on a logistic regression model for two, uh, two group analysis. Uh, all POMA functions are focused on sim uh, simplifying and compacting the analysis. What does that mean? For example, in the univariate analysis, instead of providing and maintaining different individual functions for each test, POMA provides one global function for the univariate analysis that can perform all different uh, univariate tests. And the same for multivariate analysis. With just one function, users can perform all multivariate analysis implemented in POMA without changing the, the input form. There are two features in POMA that are designed with predictive modeling purposes. In both regularization methods and random forests allow users to split uh, data into train and, and test sets using those tests, uh, test sets to perform an external uh, validation and providing real prediction metrics, avoiding the problem of overfitting. Here in the left side, we have an example for, for Lasso used to, to filter for feature selection purposes where end test parameter is set to null and all data here is used to create the model. And here's an example of read uh, regression or, uh, with predictive, mo predictive modeling purposes, where 20% of data is used to, to perform a, an external validation and provide a real prediction metric. The same for random forest. 20% of data here is used only to, the, to perform an external validation, providing these real classification errors. This is a... A top-down example uh, from that that allows users to go uh, here from the raw data to uh, in, in this case a, a Lima model corrected for covariates adjusted for covariates, um, including all the preprocessing steps in a few lines of code. 
Uh, this, is an uh, this is a shiny, a POMA shiny version. Uh, POMA also offers a shiny version of the package that includes all functions in the, in the package in an interactive way. And finally, the, the conclusions. POMA provides a robust, reproducible, and user-friendly workflow for, for the statistical analysis of mass spec data. POMA allows users to include different coverages in the analysis. POMA also provides its own interactive shiny version called POMA Shiny. And for sure, POMA is an open source tool and everybody is welcome to contribute. As in next steps, implementation of more functions and methods focusing mainly on multivariate approaches. Explore the feasibility of new bioconductor class to store the statistical analysis results or extend an existing bioconductor class for this purpose. And finally, gradually migrate the MSN-based MSN set of structures used now by POMA to the Q features structure for mass spectrometry assays included in Q features packets. Thank you all, and welcome to contribute. Thank you, Paul, for the nice presentation of uh, a whole ecosystem behind the Poma Shiny app, which I saw probably a year and a half ago in Toulouse. And it's been quite a fun travel from there to get to this whole Poma. Let me just check the Q&A if there are any questions for you. Otherwise, I will have one for you, which is there is someone in the field. Echo. I try to, to audio a little. Okay, uh, I don't see any questions, but still, uh, you probably already answered that with the with the last slide. So I've seen, for example, Beatles Beatles implementation with their own class or uh, yours, and then there is this uh, MSN days and then this spectrum features, all this, the, the, the mass spectrometry, the proteomics world is quite active at this time. If, do you think it's feasible or the best that we kind of collaborate on uh, implementing the one class in the mall and then use that also for POMA? I'm, I'm not seeing very well today. So, oh, okay, sorry. I, I'm just going to try to work that in, uh, in a second. So, uh, wouldn't it be optimal if you if you all in the proteomics world can kind of converge on one common class that does many things that, like like your former package would do, and then be used or reusable for many other for many other packages as well. You mean the second part of uh, future work? Uh, I comment. The yeah. Yes. So just uh, I'm I'm thinking about the um, uh, bioconductor class or extension of our uh, some bioconductor class to. It's it's not um, it's only to store the the statistical analysis the results in a um, in a tidy format. I mean, so to, to store all lima uh, results or for uh, linear regression results in a um, in a common format for all bioconductor um, for all bioconductor uh, output. I think that this can be useful for the community. But it's just an idea, and for sure uh, the community will decide if this is useful or not. I know. I think it would totally make sense. I mean, the the, the, the marvelous uh, advantages of interoperability is that you can then switch in and out of any workflow and then basically get the best out of each side and then use cool implementations and cool, say, additional processing steps. So it would totally make sense. Uh, let me just check if there are any more questions. Otherwise, we are already running a little late or just, or just not just a little late. Uh, there is one communication from from the organizational side even if the next session is starting at 16.00 sharp then the the next series of talk will be at 16.05 and so in the interest of time i would just wrap it up here and thank again all the speakers of these sessions and uh, for making it lively and uh, for contributing to this beautiful conference